OK, welcome everybody to the second in our series of seminars uh, with Shanghai International Studies University. It's a pleasure this week to uh, introduce Professor Václav Pratsina to you. Uh, Václav has been working on Langsbox and Philippines for a very long time. And today is your opportunity to find out more about how the system works, what the latest developments are, what you can do with the system. Maxbox, of course, is our homegrown uh, concordance package, but it goes well beyond concordance and indeed has features which are unique to many of the off the shelf products, including, as we'll see, being able to work with very large data sets. So, once again, welcome to people from Shanghai, welcome to colleagues in the room. And I'll pass over to Kathleen. Well, thank you so much, Tony. Thank you so much for this very kind invitation. And I'm delighted to be talking both uh, to the audience here at Lancaster University, but also importantly to our audience uh, over in Shanghai. So uh, I will be talking about corpus linguistics, data visualization, and emerging technologies, and how we as corpus linguists can respond to those. Because I think. Now is a really exciting time to be a corpus linguist because uh, there are so many things happening with large language models out there. And obviously all of you have had uh, or maybe even used uh, some of uh, some of these uh, technologies. So I would like to contextualize corpus linguistics within the emerging technologies that we are going to experience uh, much more over the coming months and years and uh, how we can actually make sense of language data using uh, tools such as Langsbox that Tony has already mentioned. So starting with corpus linguistics and the plan for this talk is to start with a more theoretical background and then uh, move towards some practical solutions uh, and give you a tool that you will be able to use in your own research for free, using it for any uh, language data in any uh, uh, in any language, English, Chinese, or any language of your interest. But let's start by looking at a very simple definition of corpus linguistics uh, that actually situates uh, this talk and gives us some useful pointers to start with. So as Brazina and McEnery 2020 say, corpus linguistics is an approach to the study of language that uses computers to analyze large amounts of language data, both written and spoken, which we call corpora. The simple definition situates corpus linguistics in the tradition of linguistically grounded analysis that makes use of the development of computational technology. And I think this is really, really crucial for our argument today to draw on evidence about language use that would not be accessible otherwise. So there's a unique selling point to corpus linguistics that is the combination of the data that we have also in the name of the discipline, corpora, but also the emerging technology. And when you look at the history of corpus linguistics, and if people are interested in the history of corpus linguistics, you can go to this website, scan a QR code, and there are some nice examples of corpus technology going back to the uh, 1960s, starting with the punch cards and the early corpora all the way uh, to the present moment. And there are some uh, nice videos where I go through the old software tools and uh, try to make sense of them for myself as well. But the crucial message here is that corpus linguistics is intimately connected with the development of the technology. In fact, uh, the 1960s and the 1970s with the early corpora such as the Brown Corpus or of course the Lancaster Oslo Bergen Corpus, the Lob Corpus, uh, this type of uh, analysis was made available through the advances of computational technology. At the time, still mainframe computers, as you can see here, but later on also computers that we all have access to and are actually much more powerful than the early computers. So I think, as I said, this is an exciting moment to be a corpus linguist uh, because we have access to uh, huge computational power that we can use to our advantage. 
So where did the new technology uh, comes in? And this part is largely speculative, uh, but I would like to address some of the questions related to AGI and large language models and uh, the response that corpus linguistics might have to these emerging technologies. Obviously, you don't need a crystal ball to see uh, the direction of travel. Uh, AGI uh, is becoming part of our everyday uh, working practices uh, and communication. AGI is not only a tool, but it is an environment uh, that we will have to get used to. If you look at the most recent developments, such as the integration of the co-pilot technology in the latest update of the Microsoft Windows operating system, the idea is that people through their everyday interaction with their computers will have also access to this new technology when writing, where reading, where interacting with other people as well. So this really creates this type of environment idea uh, where much more text will be available because you can generate much more text than in the usual in, in the usual sense of uh, the uh, right right. Obviously this raises multiple questions and we will look at some of these critically uh, very briefly uh, at the beginning of this uh, talk. So much more text is available but is there actually need for conciseness and to express ideas that are relevant. So how do we pick the texts that are relevant if you have much more text, the wealth of the text available? And what is the role of the human being in the middle of the process in here? I think these questions will be largely connected to the delegation versus control when you think about how much of the power we want to delegate to the technology and how much of the power we as human beings want to retain and need to retain for these processes to be meaningful. And that's why I think there will be some implications for meaningful communication that I will highlight as well. So just tackling this last two points uh, related to delegation and control. So imagine as a metaphor, the sort of self-driving cars where you delegate all the power to the machine and you sit back, relax if you can, and hope that the technology can do the, 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 the work successfully. And obviously this has been uh, tried and in, in some cities you can uh, have have these these cars operating as taxis for instance so you know there's a empirical evidence that within a particular context a very narrow type of context a narrow type of task this is possible the question is whether in our other practices such as writing uh, for publication for research whether this type of approach would be feasible and i think there are some clear distinctions between these two uh, situations. If you look at how the editors and the journals, because they will have to adapt to this new situation as well, as well as the universities, uh, react to that. Uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors have a very interesting take on that. They welcome the uh, introduction of uh, ChatGPT, chatbots and the AGI technology. Uh, but they have some rules about transparency and some rules about responsibility, which I think are very interesting to note. So they say authors who use technology should describe in both the cover letter and the submitted work how they used it. Chatbots such as ChatGPT should not be listed as authors, crucially, because they cannot be responsible for the accuracy, integrity and originality of the work. And these responsibilities are required for authorship. So they define authorship through these uh, particular components and say, well, we can't delegate those to the technology. And I think this is this is crucial. No matter how much text is produced through these, the responsibility lies with the human researcher. And I think there's a sort of very clear line here. And I think this is something worth remembering when we think about how we interact with uh, technology.
So just taking back to a philosophical argument uh, about the technology and where we see uh, the core of meaning when we think about communication. John Searle, back in the 1980s, uh, guides us through this thought experiment that has uh, later become known as the Chinese room. So he asks us to imagine this situation. Suppose that I'm locked in a room and given a large batch of Chinese writing. And John Searle doesn't speak any Chinese for the purpose of this argument. Suppose, furthermore, that I know no Chinese, either written or spoken. Now suppose further that after this first batch of Chinese writing, I'm given a second batch of Chinese script together with a set of rules for correlating the second batch with the first batch. The rules are in English and I understand these rules as well as any other native speaker of English. They enable me to correlate one set of formal symbols with another set of formal symbols. And all that formal means here is that I can identify the symbols entirely by their shapes. For the purposes of the Chinese, I am simply an instantiation of the computer program. A visual representation of this uh, metaphor or thought experiment is this. So we have John Searle in the middle. He has some rules, so a book with one Chinese character matching another Chinese character. And he's getting some input here from a speaker of Chinese. And he chooses the right type of response and then outputs this. The people who do not see inside the room might suppose that the, pe uh, that the person inside the room actually understands and speaks Chinese because they can respond directly to that. But Searle argues that actually, replace the person with a computer here and the same type of response would be possible. And in Searle's mind, this is a very different type of response than a response that would uh, be uh, connected with understanding the language. So Searle says this doesn't uh, actually constitute uh, communication in the way we would normally understand that. And you can see why, because you can extend this thought experiment even further. So imagine that you engineer the two people out of the picture as well, and you have two computers communicating with each other. And basically the same type of transfer of information is going to happen. But there are no people to read those messages. And in my understanding of the word meaning, if there are no people, if there is no social grounding of communication, there's no meaning. Obviously, this might still be useful. Think of your bank communicating with my bank, and there might be some useful transfer of information. But it will be something profoundly different to people exchanging ideas, communicating meaning with all the social contexts that are important for uh, understanding uh, words uh, in the situation setting. So that's my argument. Uh, we can't engineer ourselves out of the picture. Otherwise, it just loses the crucial component. That this is the meaning. It can be still useful, but it will be something very different. So where does corpus linguistics come in in these uh, different competing models on the marketplace? Broadly speaking, I think there are three possible approaches to modeling language. The one very simplistic, naive approach is uh, to modeling language, form matching, uh, dictionary matching, and that has been around for quite a, quite a while. The second one are these complex computational models and machine learning, these indetermin indeterministic black boxes that, however, are incredibly powerful and incredibly uh, tempting and I think they would become part of our everyday communication practices. And the third approach uh, that I distinguish for the sake of the argument is corpus linguistics. And I would like to show how these differ essentially and the merits uh, of each of those uh, individual approaches. So let's take the first approach that sort of what I call naive 
form uh, matching. Uh, there are different flavors of that, but broadly speaking, there's a, a very popular approach to language in sentiment analysis. You can see that a lot in marketing, in uh, thinking about uh, customer feedback. So imagine that uh, you're a manager of a company and you are interested in whether the customers that bought your product are really satisfied with that. And you collect their feedback and you get something like that. And there are four instances of the adjective good and the feedback and the sentiment analysis based on just the formal properties would say, well, four times good, that must be very positive. If you go to chat GPT, you can actually inquire about the individual uh, nature of the feedback. And this is my own interaction with chat GPT. I say a customer left the following message. Uh, do you like the product? Uh, and uh, the, the message is, this is good, said the Matt Hatter. And I ask, uh, you know, for interpretation. So do they like the product? Chat GPT sort of hedges a little bit. But the core of the message is the message simply states that the product is good, but doesn't provide enough information to ascertain the customer's overall sentiment. OK, fair enough. There's some kind of linguistic interpretation, but I wasn't satisfied with the first answer. So I went on and said, well, I think your interpretation is wrong. The statement is very likely ironic. Can you please reinterpret? And obviously, ChatGPT is very happy to oblige and I get a very definite type of interpretation. Um, essentially, that the customers don't actually think the product is good. So I have two possible conclusions, but they are very different indeed, depending on my initial input. And I have no way of knowing how the black box is producing those types of conclusions. And obviously, they might make sense in that context and might, might be happy with one of those or the other, but it really uh, is not a principled way where I would be able to point to the evidence um, in, in, in a transparent way. So I think this type of approach is extremely powerful. It communicates uh, with me in natural language, but I have very little control over the, the, the output. Well, words in context, and that's my uh, case for corpus linguistics. Going back to the customer, uh, reviews and uh, I have the way uh, of looking at this and I use concordance lines uh, to show me actually the immediate context in which the word good appears. So we've already seen this example. There are some other examples. I cannot say that this would be good. Many claim that this is good. I don't agree with them. Good, that's a laugh. So based on this uh, corpus analysis, of the customer feedback, I would actually conclude that four times good in this particular context means actually bad. So sometimes good means bad, and only the context can disambiguate uh, the meaning uh, and uh, the social meaning as well for that. So as a manager, I would take very different decisions based on the analyses uh, that I have just highlighted here. So. This gives us some food for thought in terms of where we want to position ourselves and the individual merits of different types of approaches when we think about language analysis and the implications that these might have for you know, the success of our business or the success of our published article, you know, whatever we are interested in. So here's Lang's box as a possible response to all these debates and Lang's box is work in progress and uh, that's uh, one of the tools that uh, people can use but it also reflects our uh, interest in language and how we can respond to the emerging challenges as we see them. So there have been many different iterations of Langsbox. The latest iteration I will be talking about is called Langsbox X. I'll explain why X in a, in a, in a moment. 
And uh, this is a tool that has been developed here at Lancaster University at the ESRC Centre for Corpus Approaches to Social Science. And we believe that this is uh, the response that we would take if we consider all the implications of our particular understanding of language at, the, at this point in time. Obviously, there's a bit of a history to Langsbox. We started back in uh, 2015 as a tool that had a single purpose to visualize collocations, to visualize the associations in language, because no other tool previously was able to do this on the fly, although the theory was there uh, from the 1970s, 80s. So uh, this was a sort of step forward for people who had their data, but they wanted to see the connections and interconnections. Uh, through a method that we call collocation networks. In 2020, there was a major milestone where we introduced a lot of automation, and this was pre chat GPT. But at that time, Langsbox would be able to produce automatically research reports that you would be able to edit. So you would uh, select the tool, your search terms, hit a button, and you will get. 50 page research report in Microsoft Word that you would be able to edit that would have all the key components, introduction, method, data, procedure, results, tables that were nicely and beautifully described, uh, images, figures, all labeled, all, all captioned. So, you know, all the hard work that, you know, we don't like to do as human beings, it's so repetitive. Uh, Langsport would do, uh, not, not using large data models, but uh, predicting the needs of a particular group of users, corpus linguists in this particular case. And obviously 2023 is the uh, big launch of the X version of Langsbox, X for flexibility, but many other, other things as well I'll talk about. Uh, a new infrastructure because uh, we've experienced much larger data being available. And the previous versions were just not that good at coping with billions of words rather than millions of words. So uh, we've come up with this tool that is available to anyone who would like to so download it and give it a go. So a uh, free tool available. So you can go to the Langsbox website. Uh, some of you might have already uh, seen this before or even used Langsbox uh, before. Uh, where you can download the tool for any operating system, Mac, Windows or Linux. So it works on an um, ordinary machine. I always test it on my travel laptop. So, uh, you know, you get the sort of dynamic. The power of X or power of 10 is just to demonstrate uh, the size of the corpora that we can deal with at the moment, and this is running on a travel laptop, so an ordinary, ordinary laptop, and you can see this video being in real uh, time. So what I'm searching here is a two billion word corpus, the Hansard corpus, uh, which has 200 years of debates in the British Parliament, both House of Lords and House of Commons, and I'm ser searching for the term vaccination, and I'm looking at associations. And uh, in a few seconds, I get a full list of those associations and a graph that will allow me to investigate those connections. So these are associations with vaccination, one of other, our other projects uh, that uh, are relevant for the parliamentary debate over uh, the course of 200 years. Obviously, I get my context because contexts are important for meaning. And I can also look at the broader context, the metadata, and you can see that I'm getting, you know, all uh, 200 uh, years uh, of the debate, but I can select a subset of these. There's a date picker, so you can very easily and naturally uh, interact with the environment that you have always control over the source data in this particular particular way. So there's the power of X. We also think there's a bit of an X factor uh, to uh, Langsbox as well. Uh, here you have a Mac version that uh, looks particularly flashy uh, with uh, that sort of uh, environment, um, but in all the operating systems you get uh, the full functionality, the visualization of uh, word lists, um, 
and connections between words. So there's a very simple way to start with Langsbox. You go to the website, you download it, and it comes with an example corpus, so you can start searching straight away. You don't have to provide any data, and there are many more data sets that you can download in different languages. So we uh, offer, for instance, the British National Corpus 2014 for download, or the Lancaster Corpus of Mandarin Chinese, uh, a wonderful one million word data set uh, of written uh, genres in Mandarin Chinese, so people can use it with uh, different different languages, or you can import your own data in any language. So when you start, you can type in a word or phrase or a grammatical structure, and the tool will search for it. It is incredibly flexible, so you can have as many windows open as you like on your screen. You can uh, drag them and uh, resize them and have uh, these analyses. Uh, run side by side. You can even highlight all of the windows and search in them at once. So it can sort of speed up the process of analysis as well. And as I said, you can add your own opera, load them in the latest release, which is version three. You can also scrape data from the web. So you can decide that you want to, for instance, uh, look at a particular topic in the newspapers or in Wikipedia and uh, the tool will do all the hard work for you. So you, you get uh, corpora uh, in Langsbox very, very easily. So uh, downloading the British National Corpus to your machine obviously depends on your uh, speed, but all two gigabytes of data uh, can be uh, uh, with you and uh, you can start using it straight away uh, without connecting to the internet at, at that at that point uh, because it all will be saved on your local local computer. We are particularly proud of the types of searching that Langsbox uh, can perform. The usual corpus tools require you to learn different types of uh, conventions, and Langsbox also implements the traditional conventions such as Corpus Query language. But Langsbox is unique in the sense that it allows users who are beginner in Corpus linguistics to start searching straight away. We've implemented a number of what we call smart searches. So if you want to search for an adjective, you don't have to think about, you know, how is adjective annotated in my data? Um, annoyingly, it starts with J as a, as a as a label. So if you don't know that, you probably wouldn't wouldn't get get that. You simply type adjective as all caps into Langsbox, uh, followed again by noun, verb or adverb. You can sort of have chains of these, and Langsbox will provide the answer uh, for you. So just to demonstrate how the searching works. Um, this is the tool for concordancing that we call quick tool. You can uh, type in passive and you have all the passive constructions. You don't have to uh, think about, you know, what sort of uh, elements I need to put together in order to come up with this type of analysis. Again, even fairly complex syntax, syntactic structures can be uh, identified fairly, fairly easily. Adjective, noun, verb, adverb. You can filter uh, the data uh, in any way. So you can see whether particular word or structure or grammatical uh, tag precedes or follows in the in the context. So you can also uh, use the semantic tagging that is available in Langsbox. So if you type people, these are words connected broadly with people, human, human beings. You can type in weather or you can type in body and you have you know, the same semantic fields available to you in your corpus. The semantic tagging is also available uh, for your own data. So if you have data that doesn't have that tagging already, you can do that inside Langsbox uh, straight, straight away for major languages, including uh, <coughs> English, Chinese, Spanish, Arabic, and the, the, the sort of major, major languages. Obviously, this is for uh, advanced users. If you were wondering about this query, this is called uh, Corpus Query Language CQL, but you don't have to worry about that because you can get the, the, the same results uh, 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 in, in an easier way, but 
if you are an advanced user, you have full control over your queries through uh, the more technical uh, Corpus query language. You have also access to larger context because context matter for meaning. So if you just hover with your mouse over any of uh, the uh, concordance lines, you get much larger context for you to explore, but you can also explore full texts if you are interested. Um, everything can be copied pasted easily into your research report. Uh, I always have struggled in other tools, and this was one of the things that we introduced straight away in Langsbox, where you have a number and then you have to sort of copy it, retype it into another tool, and then you make a mistake or you have to go back and forth. In Langsbox, you don't have to do that because uh, everything can be just uh, easily copied, pasted uh, into your research report. And obviously you can download the whole set of results and uh, open them in Excel, for instance, for further coding if you if you need to. So there are countless possibilities uh, of interacting with the tool. Langsbox ha has very powerful graphical capabilities. Um, uh, we uh, incorporate the D3 library that allows us to uh, produce different types of graphs and we keep adding those because we are thinking about creative ways of visualizing language. The visual meta, uh, metaphor for language I think is really uh, the core value of uh, Langsbox, if you like to think about it in this way. It started as a visualization tool and it still has uh, this as a prominent feature throughout the tool. So, for instance, if you want to uh, visualize your collocations, you can very easily type in a word or phrase or grammatical structure, and it will automatically identify those collocates as we call them. So, associations, words that are uh, statistically associated with the words that you are searching, the node word. So, corpus. Is obviously associated with some words, data is associated with other words, but you can also look at the cross associations, the shared collocates in the middle, so you can see uh, which ones uh, are common to uh, different uh, types of uh, data. You can manipulate the graph so you can ascribe different properties, different statistical values to different uh, features in the graph. So again, you can uh, explore this data uh, really, really easily. Concordance lines are readily available. And there are some tools that compute a few association measures. There are some tools that uh, compute them one by one. Langsbox X computes them all at once. So you can have all of them available and you can filter, you can uh, sort according to any of those or multiple of these uh, association measures to really explore language and uh, have the depth of analysis. Obviously, you can do this with um, grammatical tags or semantic tags, so you can see actually which words at the more abstract level are associated. So uh, all of this is available uh, and readily accessible in Langsbox. Words and uh, Ngrams are also available. Ngrams is a feature that will be soon released in the new version of Langsbox. As I said, uh, we are always implementing uh, new features and think about how we can extend the capabilities of this tool. Uh, the current version, version uh, three, has the words tool that will be then extended to the Ngram tool in a uh, same, same type of environment uh, where you can produce word lists. Uh, search those word lists. Actually, you can have this beautiful Zipfian distribution of the word so you can see uh, how, how these words are distributed. I'm searching for words starting with the letter C so we, I can see them throughout the, the word list, but you can have a more meaningful search uh, depending on your uh, research questions. All of these will be highlighted you can also choose different types of units, lemmas, and for the first time in history, I think, uh, lexemes. So a combination of the head word, a particular word class, and a particular category of meaning. 
obviously this all depends on loads of assumptions so not all of these will be 100 percent accurate but it will give you some useful insight into how language works you can produce keywords by clicking in a keyword uh, or the key key icon select a reference corpus and um, see which keywords are relevant for you all major uh, keyword statistics are uh, computed at once so again you can pick and choose the ones that are most relevant uh, for your research depending on your research question we talked about the importance of context and uh, Langsbox takes context really really seriously uh, the short context the snippets uh, the concordance lines that we uh, can uh, browse very very quickly and read uh, vertically but also the full texts uh, that uh, are available for analysis uh, using the tool that is called text uh, for simplicity here i have a uh, corpus uh, downloaded from the English Wikipedia related to linguistics. So just as an example, I have uh, texts which are small and which are large. The visualization shows the size of the text in terms of the token. So oh, I can see you know, the uh, distribution of those. I can search for a uh, particular word inside those texts, such as language. And I will get uh, these highlighted using color. If I wish, I can sort them from the largest relative frequency to the lowest relative frequency as well. So I can explore my data and at the same time, I can be looking at the uses of language in context, uh, scrolling through the text where the uh, search term is highlighted and I can get a good sense of uh, the nature of the data that I'm uh, working with, because I think this is really, really important. And that will be my uh, final point uh, when uh, we get to get to the conclusion of this lecture, because uh, I think corpus linguistics is unique in the sense that it offers the high level abstraction as well as this uh, bottom up uh, access to the language uh, reality that is uh, that consists of written text and spoken transcripts uh, where we can actually see the full contextual uses of language, both the context that, uh, that appears uh, in, in those texts, but also broader context, uh, the types of speaker, because we can have metadata available about any of, of, of these. So if this were a spoken text, I would know uh, the age, the gender of the speaker. I would know their uh, socioeconomic background um, and all the information that is available in that particular corpus and obviously the spoken British National Corpus 2014 is a richly annotated data set uh, and you can exploit it in a particular uh, way that we hope can be helpful to a range of users. So back to data, we started with the definition of uh, corpus linguistics as a discipline that uses computational technology to explore ever larger amounts of data and the metaphor in this slide that I'm using for the data is the uh, night skies uh, where you can look and zoom on to emerging patterns as you can see the constellations here and these constellations can have different names, people in across different cultures, so different objects and name those constellations accordingly, a plough uh, for the same type of constellation or a wagon. Uh, if you step back, you can see the other stars as well as uh, uh, the Ursa Major, the, 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 the big bear here. Uh, but overall, we have to distinguish these two levels that are so important and I think that's one of the crucial selling points of corpus linguistics when you think about the uh, other possible approaches to language that we highlighted at the beginning the large language models or just as a form for matching corpus linguistics is really grounded in the realization that there's a distinction between data and interpretation of the data and 
keeping these two things separate, I think, is the success where we retain the control. We can still be authors of our research if we maintain this distinction. So we still have the uh, stars, but we can interpret them in a different way. And that works in the same way for social objects and social constellations. So I'll pause here and just ask if anyone might have any questions. So thank you very much, Václav. That gives us a wonderful update. Uh, and also contextualizes it within the context of developments, very recent developments in AI. So we have some people online. Uh, Hannah will be keeping an eye out there for any questions that they may have. But if any of you have any questions, now is the big chance. He's standing in front of you. If you've ever wondered, I wonder why it does that. This is your chance <laughs> to ask. So does anybody have a question? Veronica. That's left the, on the semantic tagging function. Um, what is it based on and what languages is it available for? We, it is based on the enormous research that has been done for USAS. So it's Paul Rayson and, and the well-established technology of USAS tagging. So all the USAS uh, lang supported languages are available in Langsbox as well because they have become now uh, freely available and that can be integrated in other tools as well. So your tool sort of calls out to that, gets it processed, brings it back in and presents it. It actually does that all uh, on, on site, so it integrates the, the, the model inside Langsbox. So Langsbox can be used offline, okay. so you never transfer the data over the internet. So it's sort of got with USAS inside. So yeah, it, it, is, it, is, it is. It is inside the same box, to use the same metaphor. <laughs> now, you, you were showing us before the various uh, association statistics, for example, mm. that you can have. Now, these things are always changing. Um, is there any way of putting your own association statistics in there or ed editing them? Absolutely, uh, because Langsbox, one of the uh, features of Langsbox is that it integrates the best approaches to language and statistics that are available. So, for instance, for this type of feature, Langsbox integrates R, the statistical package. So, uh, these statistics are defined as R scripts and there's a folder where you can drop your own favorite R script. So it's uh, infinitely extensible in this, in this way. Or you can also see this, uh, what, what the equation is when you are interested in what's happening That's in the useful. background. Um, so you say, for example, could you do that in keywords as well? You could use different, could you pop your R script in there and use a different measure of keyness? Currently, this is a feature we are working on. So this is currently available in collocations only, okay. but in the future, this will be available throughout the tool. I need to know. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. It's been really interesting. I'd like to ask you if it is possible to extract keywords uh, with a subcorpus of the British National Corpus 2014. I mean, if I upload my own data, I can compare that my own data uh, against a subcorpus of the BNC 2014. Say just the newspapers. Yeah, for example, the newspaper, because Absolutely. I'm I'm trying to build my own corpus of uh, news article. So I was, in order to get the query terms to download the corpus later, I was thinking about extracting keywords. So I downloaded a pilot corpus and I wanted to compare my pilot corpus to, uh, against a, a, a newspaper corpus, for example, from the British National Corpus 2014, in order to see you know, which yeah, are the terms. Absolutely. OK, and is it possible to compare it with the whole written part, not just the newspaper? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So okay. this feature is, it is incredibly flexible. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. You can, okay. you can do, do all, all this because <laughs> we recognize the importance of selecting a reference corpus that best matches your research question. So if you are interested just in the differences uh, between newspaper language, you want to have your reference corpus as closely aligned uh, with that. Or if you want a broader uh, reference corpus like all writing, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that. So uh, there's a simple drop down menu where you can select your reference corpus from any defined subcorpora in the in the tool. So absolutely, yes, it is readily available. Just one quick way. Thank you very much. That sounds like good news for you. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Sorry, there's one behind you. Matt. I have two questions. Um, two indeed. <laughs> so, so I 
haven't used this one, but I used the former last box, and I was just wondering, uh, first, is there a merge function? So, like, if there's synchronization errors, like, I can just merge it, like, okay, actually, these are counted as two types, but they're actually just one, so they should be merged and count as one type. Is that possible? Or, like, if I see a phrasal verb, and then it was not tagged as a phrasal verb, and I need to tell the system, like, this is a phrasal verb, if these are all the instances of this phrasal verb, so don't count them as two. Yeah, so types wouldn't be because types are sort of uh, objective entities. So, you know, if, if it has different form, it will be counted as a, as a different type. But for annotation, uh, we are looking into. So currently the, the answer is no, you wouldn't be able to do it within the system. You would have to uh, download the annotation and upload it again. So correct your data prior to uploading to Langsbox, but we are looking into ways in which this would be supported in the future. It's slightly technically complicated to do this on a large scale, but uh, uh, we recognize that this is a very important feature because again, you know, bringing back the human analysts into the picture, I think is really, really crucial. So being able to uh, correct error tagging, for instance, uh, 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 or, you know, any, any, any additional annotations, pragmatic annotation of the, of the data. So uh, feature in progress. Or even, I guess, just making different tokenization mm -hmm. decisions of the one imposed on you by the corpus builder. So you, you might want to say, actually, I think this um, Ghana mm -hmm. is actually two things wrong. You might, you might want to glue them. In. So sometimes we do inherit these tokenization decisions by the corpus builder. And I guess you're saying that you want to impose your own token organization yeah or even like um with double your matrix with uh Uses, right so there's a big category called c99 which is unclassified <laughs> right <laughs> so if, if, if there's an ability for us to just like go through that list and say like these are the classifications so i can actually use the semantic tagger better yeah, yeah right? absolutely i think this is a sort of certainly a you know highly desirable feature and you know something that we want to add in the in in the, in the new uh, updates uh, com coming up on the tokenization front uh, Langsbox, I think as the first tool I know of uh, recognizes two types of tokens uh, uh, called space tokens and grammar tokens so the grammar tokens are those that have uh, high assumptions about language so you know when you and gonna uh, going to so to 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 elements analyzed after the so grammatical process, but we also recognize that there's this uh, physical reality of the text, so the spaces that we that we add. So you know we want to sort of distinguish these 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 levels, so the pre-theoretical and the theoretical level. And you know on the pre-theoretical, we all hopefully can agree, and then we can have different theories of grammar uh, where we can uh, add our own uh, distinctive uh, analysis to to those. I see no other questions, so you may as well have your second. So my second question is regarding to keywords and dispersion. So I know that recently there's a lot of um, developments and talks about dispersion. Um, is there a way for me for keyness to make dispersion cutoffs? It's like, OK, if the dispersion is below 10%, don't include this in the combination of keywords because it's below 10%, it's not generalizable. Yeah, you, you can do that because uh, the words tool competes uh, all major dispersion uh, measures and you can filter according to those. So you apply a filter on uh, your uh, words, uh, word, word list, and then you say, or oh, bring it, bring bring this to uh, to the keywords keywords table. So you can you can do that by having, you know, sets filters according to, you know, different parameters that are relevant for you uh, particular use. Thank you. Please. So I, I understand that Cobra have been being used in the language teaching for a long time. So how how would it be different from using Cobra in language teaching to using Langsbox in language teaching? I, 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 I assume like like collocation graphs to be great. Absolutely. And you know, the smart searches as well, because I mean, we've done a lot of work with secondary schools uh, in the UK, but also uh, EFL classes abroad. So there's a, a beautiful study by uh, our former PhD student, Tanjun Liu, who used the graph call function in uh, Chinese uh, uh, classes at the university level, first year university students. And uh, she actually shows uh, empirically that this type of approach is 
really beneficial to students when they develop their academic writing. And you can sort of experiment in other contexts as well. And you know, we will be uh, uh, really glad to hear from anyone who is using Langsbox in the classroom context to see whether you know which features are particularly relevant to them and how we can improve that. The whole philosophy behind Langsbox is that uh, you shouldn't need much training, actually no training at all. And this is what we observed in the secondary school uh, classes. You give people access to the tool, they have a search bar, so they start searching. Then you can so explain you can do you know multiple different things, but there's a basic instinct finding out about words. The secondary school students would in the British context obviously uh, inevitably search for swear words or so things like that uh, to start with, and they would find many in the BNC 2040, uh, and obviously visualize the connections between words. And again, that comes fairly naturally to see one word is connected with some other words, and you can sort of double click on those and see which other words this is connected with. So I think this type of seamless transition uh, in, in the classroom context where the teacher doesn't have to uh, give students to read a manual, but they can start straight away. Yeah. So I'll just type a couple of things on that and then come to a question now, which is one. If you watch Batslav's history video, you'll see the developing functionality of Corpus Tools. And it's that developing functionality, I think, that en enable more classroom activities. Than were possible before. So that's a useful thing to just look how bad it was in the past, <laughs> but that was still miraculous by comparison to the present. The other thing I suppose I'd say is just a personal reflection on visualizations. As you know, uh, I tend to balk at them because I usually want precision. Mm -hmm. So I look at it and think, well, I could have a table, it give me precise answers. <laughs> uh, but of course, naive users or people who aren't interested in that precision probably do get a lot out of visualizations like word clouds, which I generally hate. I can see that for people who just want a quick gist and might be afraid of numbers, big word, small word is a nice visual metaphor for frequency. I think the same is true to an extent of collocation networks. I, I usually see them just to represent a collocation. Uh, whereas I'd normally see a sort of list of uh, effect sizes, something like that. It seems to be something that people have taken to the visual aspect of it in a non-technical uh, context where precision isn't so important. There was another question. Okay, uh, I'm wondering if uh, Langerbobs uh, uh, has a very efficient way to deal with false positives. You see, nowadays I'm uh, running my uh, as a paper and when I uh, send a uh, query into the computer, which is the Chinese phrase, um, 上半年, which means the first half year. But uh, you, you see the corpus returned uh, over 30,000 uh, concordances. So um, I'm, uh, re uh, I really think it is very chorus to read through the concordances. So I'm wondering if uh, it has a very efficient way to deal with this problem. Yeah, I think there are sort of two components to, to that. One is the sort of false positive, which is a sort of problem of seeing things that you don't want to have in your in your query, and that's a sort of matter of precision. So you know how you formulate your query to be precise, and obviously sometimes you have to download the data into Excel and separate the ones that are relevant to those uh, that are not relevant. But just dealing with the size of your evidence, I think Langsbox has a very natural way of. Uh, dealing with, with these things. I think it's the only tool I know of that automatically randomizes your concordance lines. So um, you will see them in a random order. So if you take uh, top 100, there will be a fair representation of your corpus and you can you know, apply more qualitative type of analysis and make your analysis much more manageable without actually compromising the reliability and validity of your research. So you can take the top N results and uh, this this is this is and you don't have to do anything anything about it. You just you know scroll down, you have some kind of a uh, cutoff point you decide on what is manageable or if you have to do double coding or something something like that and you can just use the uh, the, the results out of the box. So no magic button uh, <laughs> but plenty of help to you as an analyst by the sound of it. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, another question about the tokenization, but it's uh, about the Chinese tokenization. You know, if I upload the Chinese corpus, um, uh, can I also upload the customized dictionary for better tokenization? 
is what happens with tokenization? We were just discussing this, this segmentation. Morning. Yeah, we were looking at two different regimes, we do, we, and they we gave do. very different frequencies. Yeah, and, and now I look at the uh, length box and only gives uh, 32 occurrences. Okay, so it's that's very a third different. One. Yeah, third so, one. how does it work? So obviously, if you have your very strong use of tokenization, you have your uh, particular tool that you want to use out of that. You, 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 you can you can run that and upload it, and you know it works. Uh, you know the, the usual way. Langsbox also has uh, a tokenizer or segmenter included in the part of speech tagging. So if you uh, say uh, I have this uh, data in Chinese, you select the language and say I want this uh, to be part of speech tag. As part of the process, uh, the uh, tokens will be sort of segmented, se separated. Uh, this is used, again, we use the state-of-the-art spacey tagger for that, that uses very large, large models. So it should be fairly, fairly accurate. Obviously, it's trained on large internet data, so it all also depends on what type of data uh, this, uh, this works with. So maybe if you have spoken data, you might be better off with your own custom-made um, Segmenter for 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 that. So it's an empirical question whether the current spacing uh, tokenizer would work for you for China. It's a very important thing to be aware of. Our discussion this morning was we need to think about what regime we want for it and why that regime is the right one. So one of the controls we were using is to look at Chinese grammars and to what extent the definition of a particular word relies on some type of token or implies it mm -hmm. and therefore that could guide you as to what segmentation you should go towards. So just as in English with Ghana, it's an interesting question sometimes to say precisely where the divide comes and you need some rational approach to it. But the good thing is if you do that in advance, you can have whatever segmentation you like. You feed that data pre-segmented into Langsbox. Otherwise, if you think that the spacey approach is the right one, you're very lucky, it will do it for you. But the key question is, I was talking to Lily about this morning, why that approach? Why is it right for your research question? Mm -hmm. Veronica. Yes, if nobody else wants to. No, nope, you're definitely <laughs> the next hand. Okay, um, this is beyond length box now, but do either or any of you know if there are already corpora of AI generated data? Well, no, I don't. But it would be something that would be very easy to produce, it must be said. Um, but of I, course I know there is some instability there, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know of sort of, you know, ones that wouldn't be uh, uh, publicly available, so you might need to contact them. Uh, well, I don't know, but I have another question. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Because it might be interesting to compare across genres, for instance, human generated or LLM generated. Yes, that would be a very good thing to do because the LLMs, of course, are based on very general corpora. And actually, I think one of their great weaknesses is that they usually produce something in a relatively flat genre. You can give it prompts as well, and that's another confounding thing. If you change the prompt, you can actually radically change the nature of its output like you were doing, but you can actually also do that in stylistic terms. So sometimes people have got LLMs to act in very unfortunate ways, which are usually blocked by telling it to imagine it's a certain type of author who would act in that. So there are all sorts of things that are possible there, Veronica, and it's interesting because you're sort of reverse engineering the input in a way. Sorry, there was another question. Um, I to again. Can I first check this thing from Shanghai? Okay, good. So on collocations, are we able, because you have this graph, right? Are we able to edit the graph? Like, I just want to see content words, or I just want to have this distribution because I see the distribution list, so at least I can narrow down this graph. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a powerful filtering function, so you can apply filters to any of the columns of the table that will be reflected uh, in the graph. So you can say, I want to see only nouns or only nouns and adjectives, or I want to see uh, words that are with a frequency 50 plus, or, you know, whatever your theoretical uh, basis for seeing a particular type of words in the graph is, you can apply that. Oh, perfect. And then my other question is mostly related to like, what's your opinion in the direction of blank box in terms of like, there's now more fancier statistical methods like factor analysis. And like, I think Viberg looked at like di uh, di uh, diachronic studies of like a multi-dimensional studies and seeing how it works. Do you think these features will be available in Langsbox or are there too 
trend yet at the moment. <laughs> it's something uh, not really, and I think it's about the the, the metaphor for lunchbox, so the, the toolbox that you have everything that uh, you need inside inside that that tool. As I said, lunchbox already integrates a very powerful visualization library, the D3 library. It also integrates a very powerful statistical package R. So it's just a little matter of a few tweaks where you can sort of import your own R scripts or run the analysis. It's always a matter of uh, balancing this because, you know, on the one hand, we have the teachers and students who want um, a fairly straightforward, simple interface. And obviously you might have uh, uh, advanced users like yourself uh, who would you know, require more advanced techniques. So being able to do this in a way that doesn't com compromise on the on the features I think this is sort of a UI question, but absolutely, you know, this is uh, actually in the pipeline. It is. It's something we've been talking about. Stop me if I shouldn't say it, but uh, that's like been talked to Izzy and I about introducing the factor analysis, the uh, multiple component analysis approach to uh, keywords, uh, that type of thing. Into it. So it is possible. It's just that we have one person working with one program. So there's a great list of things to be done. Uh, and it's simply a question, I think, of what gets in the front of the queue. Uh, yes, there will always be new techniques. So if you look back at the system in 2015, it didn't have many of the statistics in that have been applied in corpus linguistics, but in fairness, thought of and used elsewhere uh, at that point, which are now in that. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll have structural equation modeling and other sort of things like that eventually. Okay, right. I think we've come to the end of our session. Thank you to everybody in Shanghai. I hope you enjoyed listening to the talk answer the questions. Thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, I know there's a competing event upstairs with mine, so you probably <laughs> uh, And thank you very much, Bad Staff, for the talk. Thank you very much. Anyone want to fly uh, with some uh, basic info and the query uh, cheat sheet and all that, please feel free to. And we have another this. talk which we'll tell you about in January and June. Brilliant. Oh, it's going to be a little bit of a range of like.